Hi, I'm Natasha Watley. I'm a senior at UCLA, and I play shortstop. I was a member of the 2002 Women's National Team. We won the World Championship, and I'm hoping to make a spot on the 2004 Olympic team. I'm the leadoff batter, and I enjoy it because I get to set the tone and get momentum on our side. Winning the national championship in my senior year would be incredible, it'd be awesome, it'd be great. Just to walk. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Matt Lyle, and today is Tuesday, February 9th, and this is the Ask Coach Lyle Show, where I try to help parents, coaches, and athletes around the world tackle the challenges of life and athletics. If you're just tuning in, let me know you're here, uh, and let me know where you're tuning in from. One of my favorite parts about this show is seeing where everybody's tuning in from around the world. So hit the like button for me, hit the share button, and let me know where you're tuning in from. Last week, we had people from Australia, New Zealand, all over the world, and that was one of my favorite things, is just getting to see where everybody is tuning in from. So please, let me know where you're tuning in from, and... Uh, and hit that like button, hit that share button. You may have guessed from my intro video who my special guest is today. It's none other than Olympian, All-American, national champion, and one of the greatest of all time, Natasha Wally. Natasha, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Thank you. And I'm excited to have you. Uh, and Natasha and I will be answering all of your questions for about 30 minutes today in, in regards to just about anything. So make sure you get your questions in the comment section and we'll try to get to as many as we can today. So it's awesome to see everybody tuning in today. Matt's in Northern Arizona. We've got someone in Madison, Wisconsin. Kevin's in Las Vegas. Angela's in Central Mass. Nathan's in uh, Central New Jersey. Neil in Mammoth Lakes, California. Alex in Virginia. So we got people all over the country tuning in. Uh, and all over the world. So thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. Hit that like button. Hit that share button. Let us know you're here. Um, and also, if somehow you've lived under a rock your whole life or you don't follow softball and you don't know who Natasha is, I just want to fire off a couple of fun facts. So first of all, Natasha is the first African-American uh, female to play in the U.S. Uh, softball team in the Olympics. She helped lead the U.S. team to the gold medal at the 2004 Athens game. And just like live TV, of course, my three-year-old wants to jump in on the screen too. So uh, also about Natasha, she set the Olympic record for stolen bases. And she graduated from UCLA with a degree in sociology and a minor in African-American studies. While she was there, she also earned All-American accolades, not once, not twice, not even three times, but four times. And that is incredible. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, and thanks again for being on. As the questions are start pouring in, I'm seeing a lot of good questions. People are tuning in. Melbourne, Australia. That's awesome. Good to see you guys. Uh, I have a couple questions uh, lining up for Natasha. The first one actually is, uh, and I'm a huge coffee person. My first question to you is, you know, what is your relationship with coffee? I just define it for us. What, uh, what's coffee um, like for you? It's a must have. It's a non-negotiable. Um, if I don't have coffee, you probably don't want to be around me or you don't want to be my friend. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's actually interesting because I'm even not even sure if it's doing anything anymore because I drink so much of it. So I don't even know, you know, um, if it's even making a difference. But I definitely am a coffee drinker and I can probably drink it in the afternoon and still be fine um, wow. and go to sleep. At night. I know it's a problem. I was getting my follow up question. How much coffee do you think ounces do you drink a day? Do you think on average? Oh gosh, I don't know. I would say at least two to three. Okay. I mean, that, that's minimum. It's yeah. probably two. Yeah. Now yeah. you, uh, yeah. when you go to, when you're in Japan and you're looking for coffee, where do you go? Is it a local spot, a chain? What do you try to find? The great part, there are so many coffee shops and actually in our little neighborhood, I'm actually in Japan right now. So, um, there's a little coffee shop. It's super cute and it's called coffee likes. That's the name of the cool. coffee shop. It's super like cute, quaint. Um, there's a ton of little coffee shops all over the place. So, um, it's easy, to, it's easy to find. That's awesome. Uh, and then yeah. I read somewhere that you are all about purses. Uh, is this true? You know what's in fact, these are like, these are vintage facts. Vintage um, facts. So are you still about purses? Is this, is this an old fact or is this still something you're all about? Um, gosh, not as much as I used to be. Like literally in my early twenties, I probably got a new purse every month. Um, and like every paycheck or any little money that I got, I got like a new purse. I was all about your Louis Vuittons and your Fendi's. And I don't know, I had like expensive taste at an early age. But I think as, um, you know, maturity um, has has hit, um, I'm spending money on, um, 
I guess, better quality things. <laughs> That's great. I don't That's know great. what that is. <laughs> That's cool. All right. So uh, I, I have to give a special shout out today. Today's episode is brought to you by Travis Matthew, Apparel for Work and Play. You can check out Travis Matthew at travismatthew.com. I'm, if you're checking in for today's episode, this is the Ask Coach Lyle show with my special guest, Natasha Wally, answering your questions. And we've already got a bunch rolling in. So get your questions in uh, and let us know again where you're tuning in from. Martin's tuning in from Prague, Czech Repu- Republic. Uh, we've got mm-hmm. someone from New York. So we got people all over the world. Jose's in uh, Costa Rica. Shane's in Melbourne, Australia. And the first question of the day, which I think is a good one, is for Natasha. And the question is from Todd. Who is a better basketball player, you or your dad? <laughs> oh, he's going to like crack up. Um, I'm going to for sure say me. My dad is like the biggest basketball fan. I, he like was dying for me to play basketball. And I think that's why I gravitated towards softball, like just resisting <laughs> anything that he wanted me to do. Um, and so that's probably, he saw how good I was and that's probably why, why he wanted me to continue to play. Um, so I'm going to go with me. That's a great question. That's funny. <laughs> that's really funny. All right. Our next question comes uh, about slapping. It's from Ryan. He says, uh, Ryan says, my daughter is just now switching from the right side to the left side of slapper. What recommendations do you have on where to start? We just started watching your three-step videos yesterday. Thanks. And uh, this is a pretty common thing. Like people kind of going from the right to the left. Uh, what, what, what advice do you have for people to start in that process? Gosh, I have so much, so much advice, but the biggest, I guess my, my favorite story that I always share is whenever you go from the, you're going from the right to the left side start and finish your at bats on the left side. So I always talk about my walk of shame story. So the very first couple of times that I started to slap, I would start my at bat on the left side, I'd get two strikes, and then literally like have a walk of shame to the right handed batters box. So if you can imagine, like I already had failed before I even got to the right hand, right hand um, batters box. So um, my best advice is yes, it's going to be a little rocky in the beginning. Slap hitting is awkward. It's like a learned skill. You got to, you got to learn it. You got to figure it out. But I think um, you got to give yourself a little bit of time, give yourself a little bit of grace, but start and finish your at that on the left side. Oh, that's great. That's a good, that's great advice. Um, our next question comes from Tony. Uh, he says, what are some of the tools you use to introduce and promote the game of softball in minority inner city communities? Uh, that's a great one. I'll tell you, in, in my experience, uh, done a little bit of that uh, with an organization that I used to work with called I Love Baseball uh, with, out of Dominican Republic. And I'll tell you what, for me, uh, I was able to gather some friends and we did some free camps uh, and kind of did some um, equipment drives and stuff like that. I mean, I'll tell you, and, and I know Natasha's uh, important. this is important to you too, to me, uh, baseball and softball. Uh, in low income communities right now are, are hurting and it's in, and it's getting worse and worse. And it's something I, that uh, I can, I came from a family of seven kids who my parents would have never been able to afford travel ball or any of that stuff uh, growing up. And so uh, I, I, it's, for me, it's important. Natasha, what, is, and what are some of the tools uh, to promote the game of softball and minority inner city communities that you've seen have been successful? Yeah. Well, I, through my foundation, I have a nonprofit, Natasha Watley Foundation. We literally are bringing programs that are low barrier of entry to girls in inner cities. And um, that's super important to me. I don't want there to be a barrier of entry. I don't want there to be a high ticket price, premium ticket price for them to just learn the game. This is a fun game and it's for everybody and everybody should have that equal opportunity to learn. And so um, I just, it's free clinics. And if you can get a couple of coaches, if you can get your posse together, and if you have equipment, if you can find people to donate equipment, if you can, you know, find people to sponsor a clinic or or, or companies, they'll do that. Um, But if you can bring this game to these young ladies, because what you're dealing with, you're dealing with a community where 
parents may not see the importance of their kid playing a sport, especially for girls. And, you know, maybe for, for young boys, it's like, maybe this is the ticket for us, you know, but for girls, they may not see that and they may not see the possibilities or the opportunities. So it's super important um, that you bring this to them and, and partner with local communities. Um, if you can partner with municipalities and in inner cities, if you can partner with, Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCA's, and you know they have the access to the kids. Bring clinics, bring the information, bring the resources um, to those communities, and I think that's the best way that you can make it a low barrier of entry for those that's communities. Great. That's great advice. Um, if you're just tuning in, this is the Ask Coach Lyle Show with my special guest, Natasha Watley. And again, one of my favorite things is finding out where you guys are tuning in from. So let us know where you're tuning in from around the country. You got Buster's in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, Caesar's in Arlington, Willie's in Laredo, Texas, and Natasha's in Japan across the world. So uh, all <laughs> kinds of uh, stuff. So our next question, uh, Natasha, um, is from Justin. He says, how do you both feel about the balance between high school and travel ball for today's high school athletes? And I know, you know, it's funny for me coming from baseball to softball about 10 years ago, high school baseball was really competitive and it was something that uh, was kind of equal to the travel ball in a lot of in a lot of ways. And I got over to softball. It was much different for me. I, I, I did, There wasn't a lot of high school uh, wasn't very strong in comparison to mm -hmm. travel ball. Uh, so it's, it's been an interesting. I know with COVID, too. What are your thoughts on that? That balance? Uh, again, you know, I kind of frame it usually around the question of, you know, I play for a high school team, the coach isn't great, the team's not very good, you know, should I play? You know, I think there's a lot of advantages to still playing, but what do you think about the balance between those two things? I think that you absolutely should play. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, it's in our softball world, high school is almost considered, you know, um, almost considered like recreational and travel ball is where you're going to get recruited and you're going to get exposure and you're going to get seen and you're going to get that development. But I think the true testament, especially if you're playing on a high school team, that's not that great. Like that's where the great athletes rise. It's like, can you survive in any situation? Like, can you, can you get your team on your back? Can you know, if they're not that great or, or whatnot. But I also think too, when you're playing with your high school, you're playing with your friends, your community, like your, or your peers, people that you're going to school with. So like having that social interaction, especially in these times, like social interaction is like the most important thing. So if you can play on your high school team, like those are your people, like these are your people, like 10 years, your 20, 20 years, your 20 year reunion, you go back to your high school reunion. These are the people that you're going to um, be, be go back and see. So I, I think it's super important to create that balance and, and figure out how you can play on your high school team as well. Get those extra reps as well, playing on your high school team and um, also playing on your travel ball team as well. Yeah. And, and to me, that, that one of the saddest parts about the shift in travel ball in the last 20 years is that like, Sports used to be very community based and for Little mm -hmm. League. And, and so you had communities rally together behind people. You knew the kids that went to school and high school. Obviously, it was a big community thing where all your friends came to your games. And, and that's that's really changed a lot. Now, the people mm -hmm. in the stands are parents or college coaches. And it used to be, you know, your friends were in the stands and, and cheering you on on the weekends for games right. and stuff like that. So uh, I, I definitely wish that a lot of kids could experience that a little bit more uh, than they are mm -hmm. now. So. The next question comes from Choppers Baseball. It says, do you ever struggle with anxiety during high leverage moments? If so, do you have any advice for young ladies on slowing the game down? Is there anything that can be done uh, days prior to a game? That's a great question. That is a really great question. And I, it, honestly, I you know, growing up, I would get nervous before games. And so I never had the verbiage that it was anxiety. Um, so I think that's also something to point out too. It's like, if you, um, the way that we're phrasing these, um, things for our athletes as well. I mean, yes, it is anxiety. Um, but when I got nervous, I was able to kind of, it, allow, it let me know that I was ready for a game. Like <laughs> the times that I wasn't nervous for a game, like those were the times that I had like the crappiest games, you know, excuse my language, but, um, making sure that you kind of anticipate. And once you start to feel nervous, if you can start to visualize, I think a day or two ahead of time and start to play the game before it even happens. Once you step into the moment, it kind of eases and slows the game down. Cause you're like, I've already been here before. 
Um, so trying to just kind of forecast what you want to accomplish in that game, because I think where some anxiety comes from is trying to um, perform and to kind of reach a certain level and thinking that you have to, to reach these certain these levels and kind of having that fear of failure. So I think if you can forecast positivity, um, visualize yourself doing well, once you get into the game, it can kind of slow things down. I was like, okay, I've already had this at bat before. And so I think just visualizing, I think is a big, huge tool um, that can help with anxiety. Um, but anxiety, I guess, is, you know, the fear of the future. And so it definitely is anxiety. Um, it's just, I never had that verbiage. And so I never thought my nervousness was something like that mm -hmm. high level. When you think of anxiety, it's like, ooh, gosh, like, um, it, it, it seems like it's a huge, huge, big deal, but definitely, I mean, nervousness, same thing. I, I think that allowed me to think and know I was ready for the game. I think, I think that the medical term when we were growing up was just butterflies. I think that's what you right. said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got butterflies before the game. Uh, right. So, hey, Tito asked a good question here. He says, aside from analytics, what has changed the most in softball since your earlier playing days? What do you think, the game, how much has the game changed? Uh, like everything. Um, analytics. Let's talk about the technology in like bats and um, technology to like just analyze, like be able to visually see myself in video. I mean, we didn't have that. Um, we had to pop in the VHS tape, maybe, you know, we um, I think coaching. The coaching is definitely better. Being able, a lot of more athletes are staying around, sticking around in, in coaching, and so I just think the um, the IQ of the athlete at a younger age is much higher. Um, I think even from my perspective of being an African American, our game is becoming more diverse, and I love that. Um, that makes me happy to see. There's just a, there's a lot of different. Um, the game is much, and the, the saying is you want to leave the game better than you found it. And I definitely think that the game is much, much better than when I found it for sure. Yeah, I'll say like from my experience uh, growing up to so in softball, I didn't I didn't really watch softball, didn't know about it. But I when I did see box scores or I saw softball, I felt like it was like 19 inning games and it was a one nothing ball game. Uh, if I ever saw a score, so I, I always thought mm -hmm. my, in the back of my mind, without even watching the sport, I was like, man, these games are like 15 to 20 innings and no one scores. And then like when I've gotten to even this is the you know last about 10 years I've been in softball now, the offense in the game. Is in, it just has been incredible in the sense of the scores in the World Series. You have double digit scores. I, I feel like you just didn't see a lot of that uh, mm -hmm. back in the day, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Ask I, this I, question, and I'm going to kind of expand on Mike's question. Is there a hitter Natasha would not try to teach or convert to a slap hitter? Would she try to convert a hitter like Kelly Crushman or Lauren Chamberlain to a possible slap hitter? Uh, and, I, and I would say, I would kind of expand on that. What do you think? Is there a hitter that, or, or a style of hitter or someone that you would say, hey, this is not someone I, I, I wouldn't try to convert it. Because I come across a lot of parents that have right-handed hitters who maybe they've been struggling and they're like, oh, I have a little bit of speed. I'm going to switch them to the left side. Mm -hmm. Any any thoughts on that whole process? Yeah. And how you would identify well, that. Right. I mean, the, you gave me a great example. So for for the record, Kelly Crutchman can slap and she does slap. Um, and I think that she leverages it and like the moments when she needs it the most and when she's whether she, it's not necessarily if she's struggling, it's if if it's pairing towards a pitcher. But to answer your question, there are athletes that I would not turn. I would not turn a Lauren Chamberlain. The girl is the leading home run hitter in NCAA history. So I would never turn her to the left side. That would not do her justice. Um, I love Lauren Chamberlain and she's not, she doesn't have speed. So speed is a big part of it. If <laughs> And she, I think she'd be okay with me saying that, but that's a, that's a big part of being a slap hitter. Um, if you're going to be able to put the ball in play, challenge a defense, create a little bit of pressure. That's the whole point. Um, yeah. I, I do argue that sometimes you don't have to be the fastest. If you at least are able to swing for some pop on the left side, mix up some things and kind of just, if you run through the box and it makes a defense have to react because they know they've got to um, feel this ball cleanly or whatnot. Um, there are some people that I would not turn. So it's not all based on, you know, every single athlete I see, I'm like, you should be a slap putter. Definitely someone who's got some speed, um, who's athletic, who's agile, got good hand-eye coordination. Those would be great to turn to the left side. That's awesome. 
Um, all right, the next question, it's a slapping question that I'm going to steal this time. It says, in your opinion, is 100% slapper still marketable? Or do girls still need to also work hitting away to develop and work on power? So I'm, I'm going to steal a part of this question uh, from me a little mm -hmm. bit. From a college coach's perspective, here's what I'll tell you. If a slapper can get on base and cause havoc and steal bases, they are 100% mar still marketable and, and and very recruitable. I would tell you that uh, last year at Fresno State, I, we had a slapper who was the Mountain West uh, freshman of the year, broke the stolen base record, but she didn't really swing away. And we worked a lot on that. And she start, she hit some home runs last year. And so for me, when it comes to slappers, if they can also – power slap or swing away and they can look out of the defense and make decisions or you're the defense and you don't know if this person's a slapping, they're going to swing to me, as long as they're not one dimensional and they're just like a soft slap and run type. Uh, I think, uh, now I, I think those types, again, at the end of the day, if you can get on base and cause havoc, I don't care mm -hmm. how you can do it, but if you uh -huh. can add some things a swinging away, a power slap and the defense doesn't know what's coming, uh, that to me is the most dangerous people out there. So, uh, what do you, what do you think? Uh, are slappers still marketable in the game? Yeah, I think you hit it all. <laughs> you hit all the points. Um, definitely. Like you shouldn't be one dimensional, like, but here's the thing, like you don't necessarily have to stand in and hit away for power. So if you're a slap hitter and you have multiple slaps, like you said, you're not one dimensional, you have a soft slap, you, you can bounce the ball and you can do a hard slap. You've got to make defenses respect you. You've got to have at least a little bit of power on a slap and you've got to have something that you can just touch and go or put, put in play um, and maybe be able to put down a bun a, a couple of times. So you can be a predominantly slapper, but you've got to have a couple dimensions, but obviously you're going to make your elevate that um, athlete um, to that next level and make them more of a threat if they can actually stand in and hit away too, um, because now you've got more options and more things to pair for different situations, different pitchers, different defenses, different surfaces. So um, I think you can have um, a slapper be predominantly just a slapper, but they've got to have a short game and a power game that they can do off of their slaps. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. If you're just tuning in, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. Again, it's great to see. we got Joe in Long Island. We've got Josh in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Danielle's in Belton, Texas. People all over the world. Pocono's in Pennsylvania. Joel's in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we're going to get a couple more questions here, Natasha. Uh, again, if you're just tuning in, this is the Ask Coach Lyle Show. So get your questions in for myself and my special guest, Natasha Wally. Uh, Natasha, the next question says, hey, Natasha, thanks for all the great and sometimes free triple threat content. Seems to me slapping at a young age is so much about confidence. Any advice for coaches and players who are making the difficult transition? Uh, so thinking about, I think it's kind of centered around confidence and slapping at a young age. Any advice for those parents or younger kidders or just starting out at slapping? Yeah. Definitely. It, slap hitting is, it's tough. I mean, it's an acquired skill. And if you just put it into context, like you're sprinting at a pitcher who's literally trying to throw as hard as she can. She's trying to move the ball and, you know, hit different zones and hit different planes and have different spins. Um, and you're trying to put this ball in play and you're supposed to have touch and be able to have, you know, some type of finesse that does not come overnight. So you've got to give yourself grace and definitely confidence. And I think the the one thing that an athlete can control is knowing what she should be doing. Um, and also too, yeah, the execution may not be there, but as long as she understands what her footwork should be, what her hand should look like, if she's starting to really understand the mechanics, just like focus on that. And that's where you're going to build your confidence, just like really honing in like what you need to know. The execution will come um, and that execution comes with experience, with continuing to do something over and over again. We all know that. Um, so I think, yes, definitely confidence is it's confidence with anything. And, and definitely I just give yourself some grace to to work out through those kinks. And I think that also comes from the parents as well as parents is like, you know, oh, you're not doing it right. Like you're not getting it. You're not putting in play. But like also as parents, too, if you can give your athletes some grace, too, it's like it's OK. We're learning this thing. So, you know, it's, we're not going to learn this thing overnight. It may be a year, two years, three years. So give yourself some grace. That's great. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Tony. Tony says, your foundation is already my Amazon Smile charity. Thank you for the advice. That's awesome, Tony. Good job. 
Uh, here's a good question. I uh, I should have thought of this one myself. Ryan says, since you are in Japan, my daughter is a big anime fan, wants to know if you watch anime, and if so, what is your favorite? Did you ever get into oh, it? My God. I don't watch anime at all, and I have a travel ball team, and the girls, every time I go to, I'm go, i going to Japan, they're like, watch this, watch that. Do you watch this, Coach Josh? And I'm like, I... I I'm striking out in that category. I know. <laughs> I, yeah, I've, I know I've had a couple of friends share like so uh, some uh, videos with me, and I watched them. And I'm like, it wasn't bad. It's just like, again, it's 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 very your style, I guess. It's a very interesting yeah. uh, style. So I don't know. Uh, we got a couple more. We're gonna get a couple more questions here before we let you go. Um, Neil asks, "How long have you been in Japan?" And I know kind of you go back and forth. Uh, your favorite thing you've done in Japan. Uh, do you karaoke there? I know because we know that's big there. If so, what is your favorite song in the karaoke? So I know it's kind of three questions there, but give us a little uh, Japan and karaoke uh, for you. Yeah, well, definitely. So I've been, this is my 13th season coming to Japan. So I know it's crazy, right? Um, I don't know. This place is, is amazing. It's a, it's a unique culture, unique place. Um, I love it here. I love my team. Um, but, um, karaoke for sure. Like that is like one of the first things when we first came, the, um, team took us to dinner and then we went to karaoke. So like karaoke is very popular here. I love it. It's fun. And it's like actually kind of fun. Like just like on an off day, Monica, Monica Ab and I were teammates here. We would just go and have karaoke or go sing karaoke. Um, and if you can, if anybody knows me, of course, I'm singing Beyonce. Um, you know, that is my goal. Anything Beyonce, I am belting it um, to the best of my abilities. May not sound like her, but I, I do what I can. That's you know? awesome. I, well, I while, while, she's, um, while she's not here, let's talk about Monica for a second. What, what, what would you say Monica's go-to karaoke song when she opens the book or she already knows at a time? Where does she go? She doesn't have a go-to. Really? She is like... Well, and that's what's actually really neat about Monica. Monica has like a wide range of um, music that she listens to. She listens to everything. So I, you can't put her in a box in the, the music category. Like I'm <laughs> I'm very predictable. You, you already know what my go-to is. She doesn't really have a go-to. That's funny. All right, we got a, a couple, two more here. It says, uh, Kristen asks, uh, tips for hitting the change up and staying in the box as a slapper. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tune into this one too. Oh yeah. Well, timing is everything. So if you, especially the one thing too, if you know you're facing a pitcher who is, has multiple speeds and she's throwing a lot of off speed, you always want to time your slaps for the slowest pitch. Because if it, the, the go-to rule for slap hitting late is on time. So if anybody's blowing smoke by me and I'm just fouling it off, like I'm good. I'm good because we want to be late. Late's on time. So I always want to make sure I'm timing myself for that slowest pitch and anticipating that. So starting as late as possible is always going to help help you. And so uh, great drills are always just getting in that crossed over position and just being super comfortable and hitting in that position. So even, you know, you're going to be crossed over and you're coming up on that back leg and making contact off of your only on one leg. If you can hang in that crossover, so every time I see off speed, I want to try to hang and try to think about going left side if I can um, and just tap and go. So even if I see something slow, I want to kind of slow down my hands as well because as a slap hitter, we're just literally just trying to put the ball in play. We want to create um, some pressure on some defense and, and try to get some hang time with the ball travel as much as we possibly can. That's good. That's really good advice. Uh, all right. Maybe one of the last ones here. Mike asks, what are your opinions on the new slapping rules regarding the footwork? Uh, good, bad, or indifferent on these new rules? Yeah, I think it's good. I'm all for it. I definitely think it's going, it challenges slappers to stay in the box, but I also think we've got to challenge the battery. I mean, now we're talking about strike zones. We've got to keep the strike zones honest because, um, you know, if you're going to call it off the plate 10 feet, then I want to go and get it, you know? So I think it's, you know, it's got to go both ways. Um, so that's me, the slapper talking. Um, but I definitely, I'm all for it. I'm all for the challenge. I definitely didn't have to go through or, you know, abide by that rule. Um, those rules are as of recent. And so I, I definitely think it um, steps up the slapper's game in terms of her footwork her steps, making sure that she's staying in the box. But I think on the flip side, um, let's keep those pitchers and catchers um, honest and, or, and more so the umpire 
not it's not necessarily pitchers and catchers. It's more so the umpire keeping the, the umpire honest. True, very true. Okay, Natasha. So um, we we touched on it for just a second. Uh, I know that you have the the, the Natasha Watley Foundation, and 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 it's it's about empowering young women and help making healthy lifestyle choices and developing self esteem and 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 leadership. Uh, before I let you go, tell us a little bit about uh, you know if I want to follow you more or get to know you a little bit more, or I want to get uh, I want to know more about the Natasha Watley Foundation. Tell us a little bit about where can we find it uh, and how can we get involved. Yes. Well, there's a ton of ways. So even like one of your viewers is um, on Amazon. Um, I forget the Amazon Prime. You can Smile. pick us as a <laughs> Amazon Smile. I was like Amazon Prime. Um, you can pick Natasha Wally Foundation as one of your charities. But um, yes, you can find us on Instagram. But honestly, like we an opportunity to play this game of softball it's such a great game and we don't want anybody to have any barrier of entry to, to, to learn to to have the opportunity to play so toshwatleyfoundation.org or on instagram we're at nw foundation on instagram and twitter and on facebook nice. we're in Watley foundation so that's where you can find us all right, so everyone do me a favor today. Before you uh, do anything else, go follow those on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the Natasha Watley Foundation. And, and if, you're, if you're looking to get involved, I think, I, I think it's a great foundation to get involved with. Uh, and before you leave, Natasha, uh, everyone who's following, everyone who's been watching today, uh, I know we've had uh, over 5,000 people tuning in live today. Uh, do me a favor. Before you leave today, hit the like button, hit the share button, the retweet button, whatever you're watching this on, shared out there so when this is over uh, other people can go out and, and watch the, the these great questions and answers that natasha helped me answer today so natasha thank you again for for spending the time with us and, and answering lots of questions and i appreciate you taking a, uh, all the a lot of the questions off me today a lot of slapping questions a lot of good oh, questions yeah. made my job easy today so i just kind of had to smile and nod, nod. so uh, thanks again for being on and sharing thank you so much for doing this this is great Thank you. Awesome. Well, we'll have to have you on again. I appreciate you and uh, everybody have a great rest of your week and we'll see you soon. All right. All right.